Isn't it good to know that we serve a God who never fails? Never, ever, ever fails. No matter what it seems like, no matter what it feels like, he never fails. That's the God we serve. Praise the name of the Lord. Our kids are dismissed at this time to their classes. And this morning we have a, a, a guest speaker, um, a guest to this pulpit for the first time speaking. But I want to give you a, a little bit of background on this gentleman. We have, we have known each other for, before COVID, we, 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 we've known each other. And um, we met through Forge. He was a, an executive pastor of a large church, and his time came to an end there. And he continued, you know, seeking the Lord, and we continued in our friendship and our relationship. And <clears throat> I, wanna, I, I, I wanted to, or he came and visited us a couple of times, and, and he encouraged me, and he encouraged our church, and, and just was, was an encouragement. And, and, and he always had, like, eyes to see things differently than I do. He would notice things that I just didn't necessarily notice and appreciate things that I, I would just maybe take for granted. But nonetheless, as, uh, as, as God would have it, moving, moving forward, as we're praying for God to just continue to bring the, the right people, to continue to add the right people to our church and to core faith and to, and to direct us, I uh, had a dream with him and his wife. And then I was meeting with my brother Jeff at the... Um, townhouse and the next day who walks in the townhouse he and his wife and I'm like man I looked at him I said I just had a dream with you and as you'll see he's a funny guy he said man you need to upgrade your dreams (laughs) but I but I knew that the Lord was doing something I just didn't understand what it was Finally, we scheduled to come together. We had lunch, and as we had lunch, he began to share his heart. And you're going to hear his heart throughout this message, so I don't want to uh, take that away. But as he began to share his heart, as, as he was sharing, and I'm sitting here, and I'm like, you know, he's asking a question of me, like, well, you know, what do you think? And I, and I said, well, maybe God has been preserving you for core faith. <laughs> you know, because every pastor wants everybody to go to their church, right? That's how it is. This is not true. I want you to know that. You may think it's true, but it is not true. I, I'm, I've learned, I, this, uh, this is our 22nd year, y'all. I've learned. I don't want everybody here. Hello. It's <laughs> keeping it real with you. But I'm grateful for every one of you. Amen. Thank you for being here. Glory to God. And so as we continue to pray, we continue to seek the Lord. He sends me over some information, just, again, some of his, his history. And he shares with, shares with me a couple of documents. I shared them with Pastor Aldo. And I said, Pastor Aldo, man, I want us to pray about this gentleman because I really believe and I feel like maybe God is wanting to bring him to core faith. He's praying, we're praying. I don't know this, but Pastor Aldo reads the, the documents of, of his past and the things that he's done. And Pastor Aldo's weeping. And he's like, Lord, this is who we've been praying for. And so I, I um, introduced him to the leadership verbally, t- kind of shared the story with them. And we've been praying and, and just seeking the Lord. And Rick will tell you more about his story. But I share this with you because our intention is in the next two weeks, as long as you approve him. And what I mean by that is you got two weeks to find out any dirt on him. Hello. <laughs> but in, over the next two weeks, we're, we're, we're hoping to install him as one of the executive elders here at Core Faith. So without any further ado, I ask you to put your hands together for Rick Ray as he comes forward to share God's word with us this morning. Listen, if you guys uh, want any names or references uh, for dirt, I've got a long menu. I'll be happy to uh, send it to you, forward it to you. Uh, people who would love to uh, uh, share their uh share their experience with me, and I, I mean that in the worst possible way. <laughs> so um, they're there. there. There's plenty of them, and some of them are in my own family. So, I mean, you know, we're just trying to keep it real. Um, <clears throat> so Rosa and I have been, my wife Rosa, uh, we, we've been attending here for, I don't know, three or four months now, and we've been observing you, okay, watching, learning trying to uh, understand who you are as a faith community and um, just more about who you are, what you're about. And so we've learned a few things. Would you like for me to share some of the things that we've learned? Okay. 
All right. Get ready to write it down. This is good. All right. So we've, we've discovered, uh, first of all, with us, but then we've noticed it's this way with everybody, uh, that you're extremely warm and receptive to, to newcomers, to guests. We thought it was just us. And then we were disappointed to find out we we're just like everybody else. <laughs> We, we've noticed that you are a sweet, close-knit family church. And, and if I can use an outdated word, but it's a good word, at least to us, that's charming. Uh, that's, that's, that's a sweet thing to us. You're a youthful congregation. Most of, a, of the American churches today are graying. Uh, gray hairs, blue hairs, no hairs. Um, <laughs> I wasn't picking on anybody. <laughs> But but here there's 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 a you're more youthful than the American church, and therefore you have a youthful vibe about you, and it's it's something that's very attractive to uh, young Americans who are looking for churches. They they go to most American churches and they see people old enough to be their parents. They don't see people like themselves. You come here and they're going to see more people like themselves. So that's a very cool thing. You can't buy that. Uh, that but that's just a cool thing to have. And most churches would, would pay thousands of dollars to have the youthful vibe that you guys have got. We've noticed that you watch over and take care of each other very well. I listen to your prayer request. I listen to how you talk about one another. You know, the Bible is full of one another's. You know, love one another, uh, pray for one another, forgive one another. Uh, lots of you guys do the one another's of the New Testament very, very well, and uh, high marks in that area. Um, Bishop's doing a great job teaching you guys uh, all this stuff. Uh, you're very passionate in your worship. And so we, you know, we come from a, a, a little bit different culture. And uh, so you guys are, we, you know, we're very passionate in your worship. We've noticed that your, your prayers are inspirational. Uh, sometimes they're instruct, instructful to us. Um, and we've noticed in, your, in the singing part of your worship, when the song lends itself, there's some pretty serious three-part and sometimes four-part harmony going on here. It's beautiful. Um, my dad, my dad's family grew up in a church that didn't have any instruments, so everything was a cappella, and uh, all the hymns and everything was four-part harmony. And I, I haven't heard that kind of singing in many, many years till, till we came here. So, kudos uh, in your in your worship. Um, we've noticed that you're. Uh, you guys really seem to like each other. Now, you say, what? You just said we love each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love everybody in my family, but there's people in my family I'm not all that crazy about. <laughs> but you guys seem to really like each other. You enjoy each other's presence and each other's company. And that's, that's, a, that's a breath of fresh air. As, a, as Bishop said a moment ago, there are pastors all over this, this country who would Praise God with both hands for some blessed subtraction in their congregation. Uh, so we, we've noticed that you guys really like each other. We've noticed that you receive the word eagerly and earnestly, attentively. You've, you are focused on whoever is delivering the word of God, and you give it your full attention. And I've been very impressed with that. And then you, you seem to, to try to diligently live out the word in your, in your private lives, in your daily lives. You are taking very seriously Jesus' call to follow him relentlessly. Uh, that's what we've noticed. We hope we're going to learn more in the days ahead about you guys. But in all fairness now, that's, these are our observations. And so I, I want to give anybody here a chance to stand and correct me if I've been wrong on any of these. <laughs> Troy almost, almost stood up. No one? All right, we'll call it unanimous, and it'll go down into books that way. Thank you for being such a blessing to us in these first few months. Um, I want you to turn to Kings, 1 Kings chapter 17. And while you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. And by the way, I don't need these, but I've noticed that some of you wear them. So... <laughs> I wear them to try to help you feel better about your situation, all right? Back in the day, if you wore these, you were nerdy. Today, if you wear these, you're very cool and sophisticated. 
All right? Amen? amen? Yes, that's exactly right. And you also know where to say amen, so that's good. That's, that's good as well. So here's the question. Have you ever in your life experienced an unexplained interruption of your life? Life just moving along very nicely, thank you very much. And then, boom, something happens and just waylays you. You didn't see it coming. And you're, you're just, the rhythm of your life is broken. And not only is it broken, it, it's, it stays broken for a long period of time. And you're wondering, what happened? I was just minding my own business. And something happened to me. And now my life is off track. I'm not where I want it to be. I'm not where I don't think I'm supposed to be. How did I get here? How did this happen to me? Why did it happen to me? Have you ever experienced anything like that? All right. So what we're doing today, we're going to talk about things that that Christian people think they're not allowed to talk about with other Christian people. We're going to talk about things like being disappointed with God. We're not allowed to talk about that. We're supposed to always say nothing but, you know, that God's wonderful every day. I grew up with a little song, Jesus, Every Day with Jesus is Sweeter Than the Day Before. Well, in my life, that's just not always been true. I've had some days with Jesus that were pretty tough. And uh, I'm sure he's had some days with me where he thought, oh, Lord, he's up again. <laughs> so if, you, if you've ever, if that's ever happened to you, you understand the feelings of confusion, uh, the, the, the feelings of, of frustration, anxiety, and fear when that happens to you. And, and, and when this season comes and it lasts for a period of time, the longer the season lasts, the more fearful we tend to become. So let's look at the text together. First, cha- uh, First Kings 17, beginning in verse 2, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Has the word of the Lord ever come to you? I hope it has. Came to Elijah, personal word, leave here, turn eastward, and hide, strange word, in the Kareth Ravine, east of Jordan. By the way, east of the Jordan meant east of Israel. Jordan was the boundary. So when God was telling him to go and hide himself, he was saying, go leave your land. Go leave your protection. And go, listen, go leave the place where the word of the Lord is spoken. Go to a strange foreign land where the word of the Lord doesn't come. That's that's not in there. That's free. I'm just giving that to you for free. And it says, you will drink from the brook, and I've ordered the ravens to feed you. There, stop right there and just say this. God's got such a sense of humor. That's such a casual remark. And and by the way, I've ordered the ravens to feed you. And then he moves right on. And and I can just imagine Elisha going, what? Say what? You're gonna, who, who's going to feed me? But the Lord just says it very casually like it's no big deal. And, and it's hard for us to remember when we read something like this, for God, it is no big deal, right? It's no big deal. I mean, if you hung all the stars out and he says, I've named every one of them, and I know where they are, and there's, there's, there's trillions and trillions and trillions of galaxies. Each galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars. God says, I know all their names. I've got two kids. I can't keep their names straight. So he did what the Lord had told him, and he went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan, and he stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Here's another freebie, not related to the passage. But the ravens didn't feed him until after he did what the Lord told him to do. His provision didn't come until he was obedient. And that was a hut tough obedience to leave his land, his people, and leave the presence. They understood the presence of the Lord to be in their land. All right? So Elisha's been uh, preparing himself for ministry. He's given himself totally to the study of the Word of God and to prayer. His ministry is on a countdown to launch. He is ready. He's ripe. He's ready to go. And then God says, go hide yourself. What a, what, a, what a strange thing to say to somebody like Elijah. Elijah is a God-called prophet. He's got a fire in his heart. He's got, his whole ministry is to bring the Word of God to the people of God. He's passionate about serving the Lord. And he, he, his, his heart burns for the Lord and for the, and the Word of God. 
So passion, zeal, dedication, these are the things that God is attracted to. These were the traits of Elijah. And, And with all that zeal and all that passion and all that study and all that preparation, God says, go and hide yourself. What a strange thing to say. Isn't it strange for the Lord to raise up a passionate prophet and give him a specific assignment to his people? And then just as he's ready to go, once as he's graduated seminary, so to speak, he's ready to go, God says, wait a minute, time out. Go hide yourself. It just doesn't seem to fit the narrative. Well, the problem is for Elijah that there are, there's no people in Kareth. Not only is it a place where the word of the Lord is not being spoken, not only is it a place where the people of God are not, but it is the place where there's almost no people. Here, here he is, he's, he's, he's nearly by himself. For the next three years, three and a half years, Elijah's congregation is two people, a widow and her son. That's it. For three and a half years, that's his entire congregation. Welcome, welcome to Kareth, beloved. This is like the twilight zone for believers, all right? So I want to, I want to put up, I want to show, share with you four things, what it feels like to be in Kareth, what it feels like from a human perspective. Number one, Kareth is the place where God closes the door on what you wanted to do for him. Kareth is the place God withholds what you most want to do. Kareth is where God closes the door on your dreams and desires and leaves you with no exit door. Kareth is an unplanned and unexplained unexplained interruption into your life that when it happens, it will leave you bewildered, it will leave you off balance, and it will leave you fearful. You go to college, you train for a particular career, you, you get your degree, you graduate, but then the door doesn't open for you. There's no job there. You have the skills and you have the training, but there's no opening. You knock on this door, that door, they're all shut. Think of all the money your parents spent on your education. Likely they spent it and not you. And then there's no opening. Maybe you're already serving in your field, doing what you feel like God's called you to do. But then something happens, like an unexpected layoff or a a sickness, COVID, just shuts you down, knocks you out for an indefinite period of time or an accident, and you're out. You're disabled for a long period of time, and your life just comes to a screeching halt. Now, in last week's worship guide, Bishop wrote this, and by the way, I've got it right here. See, you didn't think people read this stuff. I read it and take notes. Bishop said, I pray you do not get stuck looking back. But can I tell you this? When you are in Kareth, when God hides you in Kareth, you're going to feel stuck. And you will spend a lot of time looking back, trying to figure out what just happened. Did I make a misstep? Did I make a mistake? Did I offend somebody? Did I offend the Lord? What happened? Have I committed a sin that I... I'm not aware of what, what happened. We spent a lot of time looking backwards. So I'm just going to tell you, when God hides you in Kareth, you, you will not understand it. You won't. Uh, but it's one of God's ways in the lives of his servants. It's one of God's patterns. God hid Noah in the ark for one full year with stinky, smelly animals who made a lot of racket at night. It was noisy and smelly on the ark for a year with thousands and thousands of animals. And he, and, he, and he hid him in the ark before his family was charged with We tend to forget this about the ark story. It's always about the ark and the flood. But he had to hide him in the ark so that he could prepare him for what he was called to do, and that was to replenish the earth. He had an Adam and Eve call on his life, but he had to be hidden in the ark to be prepared for that. God hid Joseph in the prison before he was assigned to the palace. He hid Moses in the wilderness for one-third of his life before he led his people out of bondage. 
God hid David in the caves running from an angry and jealous Saul after God had already anointed David to be the next king. In the New Testament, God hid Paul for three years after he stopped him and blinded him on the Damascus road. And so you've been persecuting me. You think you've been serving. You've been persecuting me. Guess what? You're going to be blind for a little while. And by the way, I'm going to send you over here to Arabia. I want you to make tents for three years because I'm going to have to reteach you all of the scripture that you already know from the lens of the grace of God through the cross of Christ. He hit him. Now, beloved, that's the introduction to my story. In Experiencing God, Henry Blackaby uh, reminds us something about patterns. He says, if you want to know, if if you're curious about how God's going to deal with you in the future, turn around and look back and try to identify the patterns in which he has dealt with you in the past. We all have patterns in which God works with us. Most of us may not be aware of what they are, but they're there. And Henry says, if you can identify those patterns, you have a pretty good idea of how he's going to work with you in the future. So I need to tell you two things. Two, uh, there's more, no more than two, but I'm going to tell you two things that are relatable to the story. And I, I'm pleading with the Lord, and I have pleaded with the Lord, and I'm pleading with you to, to, to hear what I say from this point of view. I have no credentials. I, I, I'm nobody. I'm nothing, all right? I'm a nobody. But, but God has blessed me in incredible ways to the glory of God. So please hear what I'm about to say in in a spirit of of genuine humility. Um, I've worked in the ministry and church ministry all my life. I've I've never had a a time in my life since I've been an adult that I wasn't involved in a local church. And by God's design, for some reason, I've never had to send out a resume to anybody. This is very unusual. Normally, it doesn't happen this way. But for reasons known only to God. God has arranged it in my life. It's one of his patterns that he has brought pastors to me. I can't explain that to you. There's no reason for that to work. But that's a pattern in his life. It's, it's been an unbreakable pattern. Every church I've served, the pastor approached me about coming to serve there. Uh, I've never had to send out a resume. Most guys go to school, get, get their degrees, make, make up their resumes, give them all their friends, and say, give them to every pastor you know. And eventually they get in the right hands and somebody will call them. I never had to do that. I I always thought that was kind of strange. The second thing, and and this is a pattern I did realize early on, I recognized the pattern early in my life, is that God has put many wise and great men in my life. And I need for you to understand this for the rest of the story to make sense. Um, God God has put great men, godly men, wise leaders, church builders, kingdom builders, visionaries in my life, liberally, generously in my life, and they've poured into me significant deposits. They've reshaped and rechanged my life. And I have reveled in the many, many opportunities I've had to sit at their feet and just drink in the wisdom of God that God had given them, that they were passing on very liberally to me. And I I think I think I've always been attracted to wise men and great leaders because I am keenly aware of my own deficiencies. I'm not wise. I'm not a great leader. And I wanted to learn from those who were. And God sent them to me. I've also been blessed to serve in all different kinds of churches. Until now, until now, and again, you got two weeks to cancel this deal, remember? <laughs> but if it goes forward until now, I've only served in Southern Baptist churches. So I don't know what God's doing here. He's, he sent you a Presbyterian pastor and now Southern Baptist pastor. And I had a, an independent, independent pastor tell me recently, he said, I can't wait to see how a Southern Baptist pastor and whatever they are over at Core Faith, are going to, are, how that's going to work. And when, I'm eager to see myself. I just don't want to mess up what you got going on here. That's my biggest concern. But I've been blessed to serve in a church as small as 130, another church of 220, 
But I've spent most of my life in mega churches, and I've served in two of the 10 largest churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. One has over 15,000 members. One has over 25,000 members. And in every church, regardless of how small or how large, God taught me things. I left the church better, better for me. I don't know about better for the church, but better for me because of all the things that God taught me in each one of those churches. And so I've spent my life mostly operating in mega churches. And I will tell you, at the executive level in mega churches, there are great requirements that are made of the staff pastors. And I, I've just spent decades work, working 60 and 70 hours a week, working weekends, working three or four nights a week sometimes, sometimes on holidays, twice been called back from vacation because of emergency of some kind or another. And I, I was tired. I was just tired. And I, I was not tired in the way that taking a couple of weeks off for vacation will refresh you. I was emotionally tired. My life had just been compressed. I'd given myself, as, as I'm supposed to, but I've given myself fully and, and wholly to the work of the Lord. And my wife has been so generous. She's never once in her life, not ever, ever once, uttered a breath of jealousy about giving me over to so much time at the church. She's understood that's part of her calling. And she's, she's given me away generously. Now, she may have a selfish reason for giving me away, like, you know, it's a lot nicer around here when you're gone. But uh, she's never really said that. But, but she has been very generous. And, and so sometime around the year 2016, I began to realize something needed to change in my life. For the last 13 years, I had not learned anything. That never happened in my life to go that long. I was stale. I was stale. And I was getting restless, and I I knew something had to change. And it was about a three-year process. And uh, toward the end of the summer of 2019, I stepped away from full-time ministry for the first time in my life. Uh, I didn't know what I needed. I just know I needed to change. I, I asked God to. Early on, I asked God to, I said, Lord, re- reset me, reframe me, reform me. I don't want to keep being the same person I've been. I'm, I'm tired of that. I want to learn something. I want, you to, I want you to baptize me in something that is brand new to me. Um, I want to learn something. I want to learn more about the kingdom of God outside of the Baptist denomination. I, I really, I really, that was a stupid prayer to pray, I, but I really prayed that. I told you I wasn't wise. Uh, that was an unwise prayer, I think, but in, in God's sovereignty, it became a good prayer. So, so here it was, I had all this time on my hands, so I, I needed to do something, and so I began working in a men's discipleship ministry um, part-time, and I took, spent about a year and a half to almost two years both tr- being trained, there's a lot to learn in that ministry, a lot to learn. But then you have to raise your own support, your own funding. So I was meeting with people, talking with people, casting vision, asking for their support. And, 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 and within just a few months after I got launched into that ministry, COVID shut everybody down. COVID shut all the churches down. And so all the churches that I'd begun to work with closed. I didn't know I was in Kareth. In fact, I didn't know any of all this until a couple of weeks ago when Bishop asked me to preach today. Preparing for this sermon taught me what just happened for the last four years. This is brand new. This is fresh. It's new to me. So you're not even going to know if I'm making a mistake because this is still new to me. <laughs> I had the opportunity uh, to work uh, as an executive pastor in a, in a nearby church. And I uh, began meeting with the pastor on a regular basis. We were, our friendship was developing very nicely. He believed I was the man I was supposed to be there. <clears throat> he had a business manager who was not only incompetent, the, the church had some developmental things they needed to accomplish, and he wasn't getting them there. And he had been in the position for five years, and the wheels had barely turned. So he was incompetent. But beyond that, he was corrupt. He was skimming church money and putting in his pocket. I knew it. The pastor knew it. Other leaders knew it. But the pastor was afraid to touch this guy because so many people in the congregation loved him. He said, if I, if I move him out, people will leave and follow him. 
and I need everybody here to help fund this building that we want to build. So while we were talking together, COVID also shut them down. And boy, when they went down, they shut down lock, stock, and barrel. They stayed shut down longer than any church in the area. Another pastor in the area knew my position. He knew what I was doing. He said, I've got a little church nearby. that their, their, their pastor just died. So let me set up some meetings with you and the guy who's running the church. The guy who was running church was the chairman of the deacons. And there's a little congregation of about 35 people. And so they just looked to the chairman of the deacons to run the church and make the decisions. You can understand that. And so I met with him. We walked with him for several months. And I showed him a number of ways that they could actually begin to reach their community. I did a little census, found out there were 850 homes within a one-mile radius of their church. And no other churches except one. And the church, the only other church was right next to them. Both churches together didn't have 80 people. And so I tried to show him this vision. I said, you, you know, we can do a lot of things here on, for a couple of hundred bucks. And there's a lot of other things we can do that won't cost us anything to touch this community. He was not impressed. He was not moved. Because new people coming into the church would be a threat to his control over that congregation. And beloved, I'm just going to tell you, there are a lot of pastors and a lot of men like this guy who are going to have to stand before God and give an account of how they mismanaged the stewardship of the congregation they were supposed to be leading. And I will not want to stand in their shoes at that time. So Rosa was watching me struggle with all of these things. and She kept saying, well, you, you, you can help these people. And I said, yeah, I think I can. And she saw how much I was struggling. And I fasted. I went on an extended fast. And I prayed and asked God to show me in unconfessed sin in my heart. And I've, I've gone on many extended fasts in my life, and God always speaks to me about unknown or unconfessed or unresolved issues in my life. But on this fast, crickets, silence. It was amazing. A nearby pastor in the area, um, I'll just say this, I'll, just, I'll try to say this very quickly. He was retiring from his, con from his congregation, his little church of somewhere between 80 and 100 people, perfect size for me. Um, he was retiring, been there 25 years. And he, he met with me a few times, and he said, would you, Rick, would you consider succeeding me as the pastor? Well, I was, I was so honored by that. I've done everything you can do on a church staff, from preschool, children, students, college, young adults, meeting adults, senior adults. I've been executive pastor, associate pastor, I've never been the senior pastor. And here's this man was asking me, asking me to consider being a senior pastor, to follow his 25 years. I was very honored and very excited. But another pastor in the area got involved in the discussion, and basically he said, if you go up to this little church, a lot of people in my church know you. And if you go over there, they will follow you. And I said, that's impossible. This is a little one-pony church and your church has a corral of thousands of horses. Nobody's going to leave there and come over to a one-pony church. He said, they will. You've ministered to a lot of people. You've blessed a lot of people, and a lot of folks will follow you over there. And then, then he issued a veiled threat. He didn't say it. He just hinted that, uh, you know, we wouldn't want it to get out that you were sheep stealing. <laughs> so... You remember Isaac dug a well, and when he dug the well, some outside thugs came in and said, this is our well, you guys move on. And the Bible says Isaac was a peacemaker, so he didn't fight over the well, he just moved to another place. It happened a second time, other guys moved in on the well. He moved a third time, because he didn't want to quarrel. And so, I didn't want to quarrel. I didn't, I didn't know what this guy would do. But I am very concerned about my testimony. I'm very concerned about my word, my honor, um, and my reputation. I've spent my life trying to build a reputation of a, of a faithful man of God. Not perfect. I'm not perfect. Ask her. She'll tie you up for days telling you how not perfect I am. But I, I wasn't going to give the enemy that opportunity, so I just passed and moved on. And Again, Rosa saw me struggling. How could I have worked for so long, decades, full-time in major churches across the country, and now I couldn't even find a little part-time opportunity somewhere? 
It's not because I was incompetent. I had led some of the greatest churches in America. It wasn't because I was an idiot. Wise men had poured into me. I couldn't understand this. Kareth is a difficult place all by itself. If, if you know you're in Kareth, it's a difficult place. But when you're in Kareth and you don't know you're in Kareth, you're in trouble. And that's where I was. I didn't know where I was, beloved. I didn't know why I was there. I didn't know what had happened. So two more times I begged the Lord and to show me what was wrong. Two more times I fasted, prayed, God, reveal my heart. Two more times, silence. I was in acute emotional distress. So then I'll just move on. There are many other stories like this. I could tell you I'm wearing you out and I don't want to do that. Um, but then we walked into the restaurant and we saw Bishop and he told you the story. <coughs> And I'm, I was thinking about Elijah, how it related to me. What, what did Elijah do for three and a half years? How did he, first of all, how did he deal with the extreme heat of the summer? I've been there in Israel in the summer. It's, it's nasty hot. And I've been there in the wintertime. I've seen it snow in Jerusalem. It can get very cold. He had to deal with the cold of the winter, the heat of the summer. And he had to deal with abject loneliness. You know, beloved, you and I are created to be with people. And ministers especially have to have people to have a ministry. How do you think Elijah was emotionally dealing with this? Loneliness, isolation for three and a half years, dealing with the elements. And the only people he had to talk to were the ravens. You think he questioned his sanity? James 5.17 tells us that Elijah was a man just like us with the same passions that you and I have. I guarantee you, Elijah had some difficult discussions with himself and some difficult discussions with the Lord. In Kareth, God grew Elijah's faith. That's what God was doing with me. I just didn't understand it. He grew his faith. He had to see the power of being sustained, sustaining this widow and her son with a little flour and a little oil for three and a half years. He had to see that so that he could go with confidence to Mount Carmel and challenge the prophets of Baal. Before you can get to Carmel, God has to take you to Kareth. In Kareth, God retaught Saul all of the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. He knew the Word of God. He just didn't know the right way to apply it. In Kareth, he taught Moses how to find water and provision for Jethro's flocks so that he could find water and provision for the people of God. Gareth is not a wasted time. It's the time when God's teaching us. All of these men felt isolated, yet God was preparing them, teaching them, getting them ready for the next promotion in his kingdom's work. So what's, what is God actually doing when you're in Gareth? It's a place of protection and nurture. All your needs are being met. Rose and I needed some help during this time. And God sent a raven or two into our life to help us. Unexpected, out of nowhere. Just a blessing from God. Kareth is the place where God will teach you some of the deep things about himself that you cannot learn anywhere else, but you must learn if you're going to be prepared to go to the next level. I hear people say, I want to go deep with the Lord. Do you? It's going to cost you something. And when I say deep things, I don't mean read another book or go to somebody else's conference. I'm talking about in your own personal life where God just takes everything away from you, strips you bare, and leaves you in a room by yourself for an extended period of time where you have to figure out what God is doing or you don't get out. Careth is God's womb. Listen, it's quiet in the womb. Careth is a quiet place. It's hard to hear God there. You don't talk very much. You're not aware that you're being carried by another. But in that quiet, you're being formed for what God is about to give you. Kareth is God's training academy for the next great assignment or season in your life. It's his equivalent of the Navy SEALs training program. 
And it's where God calls the contenders from the pretenders. You'll find out what you're made of when you're in Kareth. And a lot of people ring the bell before they get to the end of it. They ask for an out. But that's what Kareth does. It calls the herd. And all of these things, all four of these things are about God's invisible activity. You don't understand, you don't see it, but it's taking place. So whatever you've been waiting for, whatever you've been praying for, whatever you've been hoping for, God is hiding you in his womb, protecting you until his day of deliverance for your life. That would have been a good place to say amen. I had a dream um, almost a year ago. And in this dream, and I'm not a person of dreams, because this don't happen to me very often. But in this dream, I was in a great hall, big hall. And I knew where I was. I knew whose hall it was. And I knew there was a throne at the end of the hall. And I knew who was sitting on the throne. And I was afraid to look. You understand? I was afraid to look. And I was about four rows back of a large people lined all the way around the hall. And I was about four rows back. And I wanted to let the king know that I was available to serve. And so I made my way through the crowd. And as I stepped out, I heard a voice say, step back in, your time has not come yet. I told Rosa about that dream. I said, how, 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 I, I should be encouraging that I had a dream, but his message was discouraging. And then, listen to me, about two weeks before I ran into Bishop, God gave me this very same dream, same hall, same place. And this time I didn't have to push my way forward. I heard a voice say, step forward, your time is at hand. And I told Rosa, I said, I don't know what this means. Maybe I'm crazy, but I think God's about to do something. And that's when I, when I met with Bishop. And he leaned over the table with that big grin on his face, and he said, maybe God been saving you for core faith. <laughs> because I'd had that dream two weeks before. When he said that, it was like a lightning bolt went through me. I knew this was of the Lord. So um, I want to prepare you. I want to give you this, and then we're going to close. I want to prepare you for battle when you're in Kareth. I want to give you three or four things that maybe will help you when you're in Kareth. Number one, Kareth is a place of torrential warfare and satanic mind games. So gird yourself each day for battle. And remember that because you may feel alone, doesn't mean that you are alone. Here's what it means. It simply means that God has chosen to continue, continue to write your story, even though you don't think he is. He's continuing to write your story an invisible ink. And he's doing that to protect you. He's doing, listen, he's doing that not to tip his hand to the enemy. It's, it's for your protection. Pastor Aldo, Bishop, I like to hear them say, please be seated in the presence of the Lord. It's a general reminder that when we're here gathered here, God is with us. But when you're in Kareth, especially when you feel alone, remember that you are still in the presence of the Lord. He sees everything you do. He hears everything you say. So therefore, fight against words and deeds of anger and accusation and abandonment. And God heard, to my shame and my regret, God heard all of that from me. Don't do it. I'll have to give an account of those words one day. But when you're there, be warned. Don't do that. Don't let down your guard for an enemy. For a moment, your enemy's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking for somebody to destroy. And remember that in Job, in the the pit of his misery, he never charged the Lord for what was going on in his life. And then lastly, train your eyes and your thoughts for the touches of the Lord. For they are often hidden in plain sight behind all the discouragement. They're hidden. The Lord doesn't show up very much in Kareth. But you have to look for it. Train your eyes and your mind to look. Look for them. Seek them out like the ravens that showed up briefly each day. We can forget to see and be grateful for the common blessings and the common graces of life when you're in Kareth. So, beloved, I, that's my story. This is so fresh with me. It, it, it hurt me to study this. It hurt me to, for God to reveal what was going on. And it's hurt me to share it with you today. It just put me back in a painful place again. 
But maybe you can benefit from it. Maybe this will expedite or shorten your time in care of you if you understand what's going on. Now, when you leave today, if you're interested, all those teaching points that I put up on the screen, I've printed them out for you out back. I'll just ask each family to take one. I think we'll, we'll have enough for everybody. If you're interested, you don't feel obligated to take them. Uh, we got a birdcage at home. We'll put, the bottom, put them in the bottom of the birdcage. <laughs> we'll make use of them. So here's what I like to do. I like to ask the prayer uh, counselors to come forward. And I want to I give you a chance. I want to offer you a chance to have somebody pray with you. It's okay to talk about this. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It's okay to say, I feel alone. I feel like God has left me. I feel like I've been abandoned. It's okay. It's not a sin to say that. God made you. He hardwired you. You're human. He knows that. He knows your weaknesses. Don't be afraid to confess your humanness to another. Confess your faults to one another. And don't be afraid to confess it to the Lord. So would you stand with me? I want to pray and we want to give you a a time to come here and be prayed for and be encouraged by someone who loves you. Put their arm around you and pray with you and pray for you. Would you do that? Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the lessons that you've taught us. We thank you, Lord, for the humility that you bring to our lives when we're in these awful places. And we all go through them. If we walk with you long enough, we will all go through a careth season in our life. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be true to your word. Help us not to be swayed by what we see. Our heart and our mind will fight against each other. Help us to be faithful to what your word promises and not to what we're see, seeing or experiencing or feeling. Do not allow us to give in to our feelings, but help us to cling tight to your word. You've promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. We give you thanks for that. So Lord, today, if this message is spoken to anyone, would you strengthen them, strengthen them in their inner man, strengthen them for the work you're about to call them to, and help them remember that this is preparation stage that they're in. And they need to be at their very best spiritually in order to receive your next assignment. Would you do that, Lord? Would you do that in the lives and heart of your people here today in Jesus' name? Amen. Hey there. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. I hope that your time with us was helpful. Hope that your time with us was edifying to you. And I just want to say thank you for all of your support. Thank you for the likes. Thank you for the shares. Thank you for the comments. If you are joining us for the first time online, would you please do us a favor and either email me at bishop at corefaithchurch.org. That is bishop at corefaithchurch.org. So I can thank you for being with us, get to know you a little bit better. Or if you have a prayer request, you can also email me there. Or if you're on Facebook, you can go ahead Ahead and you can leave us a message here uh, directly in the comment section, or you can send us an instant message and we'll get that and respond to you as soon as we can. Lastly, I want to say thank you to all of your to all of you for your financial support. And if you would like to contribute to Core Faith financially, there's a simple way to do it. You can give electronically. All you have to do is text Core Faith. That is one word. Core Faith to 73256. That is Core Faith, one word, to 73256, and then follow the prompts, and you can be a financial supporter of the mission that God has given us. And if you are supporting us financially, I want to say thank you so much. I pray that God will bless you abundantly. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.